how do we do with one health concept? And actually, like Maria yesterday said, we have been working under this concept without naming it, but it's like underlying um, uh, concrete uh, action all the time for us. So I work as a head of program for food and waterborne disease and zoonosis. It's one of the seven disease programs in ECDC. So what is ECDC? It's one of the EU agencies and it was founded in 2004, but it became operational in 2005. And our mission is to identify and assess ongoing threats from communicable diseases and communicate them to risk managers, general public, and also policymakers. And in 2013, we got the mandate to really do the epidemiological surveillance, also host the early warning and response system, which is an alert mechanism between the ministries of health, and also produce public health risk assessments, and do preparedness and response planning. Okay, very important mandate for us is to act on our own initiative if the source of the outbreak is unknown. And this is very important for foodborne outbreaks, particularly, you will see. Our key collaborators, so ECD is an agency which does not have any laboratories. So we rely entirely on the expertise in the member states, in the countries. And we have a network of epidemiologists and microbiologists who help us and each other to tackle these uh, foodborne diseases. Our counterpart in the Commission is located in Luxembourg. We also collaborate with the Food Safety Unit and RASF contact points in Brussels. Our natural counterpart is EFSA in Italy, and we also have good connections with European Union reference laboratories for four diseases, which actually coordinate the national reference laboratories of veterinary um, networks. These are the key collaborators. So how do we do this work? We have epidemic intelligence framework and surveillance framework. So we have traditional indicator-based surveillance, which focuses on short-term or medium-term or long-term objectives. And it can be mandatory, voluntary, laboratory-based. And we basically monitor trends. And that creates data, which needs to be collected, validated and analyzed, of course. We have another system, which is event-based monitoring, which is 24-7 system. And there we constantly look through different sources and any events that are happening that may be of relevant for us. These are also assessed, screened, analyzed, and a signal can be detected from any of these uh, surveillance uh, systems. And these are also assessed on a daily basis. And a public health alert may be given and then communicated. And then, of course, we hope and expect that the response is taken. ECDC is only risk assessment institute. And we produce joint reports with EFSA, and we also produce rapid risk assessments or rapid outbreak assessments together with EFSA. Okay. So we look at the trends in priority foodborne diseases. Salmonellosis has gone down, but some other diseases going up. And indeed, for cicatoxin uh, producing E. coli, there was this large outbreak in 2011, where almost over 4,000 people got ill and over 50 people died. So we have to do something more. Trend monitoring is not enough. Case-based reporting is not enough. We have to also invest a little bit on isolate-based reporting. So there are two methods that we promoted and supported the standardization of these procedures. 
It's Melba for salmonella tufimorum and also for enteritidis. And you can see that they were actually standardized and validated in five years distance. So it's very slow development. So how do we want to strengthen these objectives? We want to, by applying the molecular epidemiology and molecular typing techniques, we want to detect early ongoing multi-country events, so that uh, particularly addressing these dispersed clusters. Also detecting the re-emergence and spread of virulent strains, identification of persistent strains. And this is very important, which I really want to challenge and highlight to you. With these new techniques, we are able to identify persistent continuous sources that causes prolonged epidemics, prolonged infections in humans. And this is something where we can play a role. Of course, identification of transmission chains and new risk factors are also important. So what has happened actually in investing this molecular typing in has surveillance under the One Health concept? This ESTEC outbreak in 2011, this was really a wake-up call for risk managers in the Commission, but also for us and everyone, everybody. And Commission developed a vision paper on molecular typing support, particularly for outbreak preparedness. At the same time, we initiated our own pilot to collect molecular typing data. And then next year, 2013, the Commission requested ECDC and EFSA to establish molecular typing databases and perform also scientific analysis. So then we established also a joint committee with EFSA to oversee how these joint molecular typing databases would be implemented. We evaluated our pilot, and then in the end of 2015, there is a really uh, intensive transition going on with the molecular typing techniques. A new technique, whole genome sequencing, is coming strongly in, into the field. And we were able, in, in the end of 2015, to provide whole genome sequencing support to multi-country outbreak investigations for the first time. Uh, but next year, 2016, we managed to reach the collaboration agreement with ECDC, EFSA and the three uh, ERLs. So we, we had to do this collaboration agreement because it's very important how to share the data, how do you respect the data owners and the confidentiality of data. We both feel that we have sensitive data. Also, human data is sensitive, but so is food data as well. If we want to put these together, we have to have a common, agreed principles. How do we do with this data? How do we analyze it? OK. <clears throat> And then, actually, in the beginning of this year, Commission also realized that this new technique is coming strongly. So they actually requested us to integrate the new technique into the joint database. And that work should be done by the end of, <coughs> by April of 2019. But the first non-human isolate was actually submitted to this joint database in 2000. 17, so this year. This highlights the slow, slow development. You start something in year one, and then it takes several years to reach agreements, really make something happening. And you need then lots of patience, of course. Anyway, we have now improved a lot our signal detection and response to these multi-country events. So we get these signals and we produce weekly cluster reports back to the member states. And you can see that it's a long list of clusters. So we have lots of signals which are microbiological signals. But we, this is not enough. We need also something else. We need to also know that something is going on at the national level. Because only this way we can put resources and actions together. And we, are know, we know then also that member states are willing to invest their time and resources to investigate the, these outbreaks. And this happens usually in this uh, EPIS platform where country can 
launch an urgent inquiry when they detect something unusual increase of cases in their country. And now, when we are able to provide this whole genome sequencing support to those member states who cannot do it today, we have a contractor for that, and we have also countries that have uh, developed their skills so they can analyze the data and interpret it. And then we can proceed with these joint rapid outbreak assessments with EFSA. It looks very uh, easy, but I can tell you it's not. Collaboration between EU agencies is also this AMR report, including also the antimicrobial consumption data from different uh, agencies. This is uh, an example of uh, joint action. Okay, what were the critical success factors that we got forward? High-level political support is really, really important. It has been also addressed here before. Communication agreed, so pre joint press, re press releases on joint uh, actions. Networking, learn to know each other in peacetime. And also this development of whole genome sequencing in member states and the good collaboration in investigations. Th these, has, these have been crucial. But challenge is, do we have a common understanding? Do we understand each other? We have different objectives. We want to react rapidly, whereas uh, EFSA has a little bit more uh, peaceful and uh, calm way of uh, addressing uh, things. So we have really cultural differences. We are jumping up and down. We want to do something. Something is going on. But on the other hand, there is no need to hurry. We have to look what is the problem. And we have to properly produce information for the policymakers. OK. Then the risk assessment concept. This is not understood and perceived similarly in the both sectors. And also there is a really question and discussion debate. Where goes the line between the risk assessment and risk management? This is very uh, heavy debate as well. For us, from epidemiological point of view, outbreak investigation is risk assessment. But actually, from the risk manager's point of view, traceback investigation is risk management. So we are moving forward step by step. We have a joint ACDC networks meeting next week, actually. And we jointly address this mandate. We produce these joint reports and improve the communication of these threats. And look for win-win approaches. This is something that when you partner with different stakeholders, try to identify what are those win-win approaches that both sectors feel that they benefit. Okay, and then cross-fertilization. Keep open-minded, learn from the other uh, disciplines as well. Okay, thank you. I have to give a great thank to the experts in ECDC without them. This work is not possible, and also the member states, epidemiologists and microbiologists, they are crucial and critical, and also our EFSA colleagues. I'm sorry, I exceeded my time. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Johanna. Any comments, questions? Yes, there's a lady in the audience. Hello, my name is Marela Hmus. I'm from Karolinska Institute. Um, Easy easy, it is in Sweden, but it's actually relatively unknown what you are in Sweden. Uh, That's true. And my question is, it's kind of philosophical. The, you know a lot of wonderful survival analysis, and you, you not survival analysis, that's a... That's Surveillance. 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 Yeah, yeah, and survival, yeah. probably. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you also have different modeling systems to model the outbreaks and things, and they are kind of semi-available for public, for general public sometimes. But nobody knows about them. Yes. Uh, so my question is, mm. do you only intend to communicate with big agencies and, and uh, like on the government level? Or would you like to be more known in the academic settings and on municipality level? This is a very good question, and uh, there are several uh, aspects here. Uh, first of all, I mean, we, we have to stick to our mandate. So if we want to communicate and publish, for example, these risk assessments, 
we are not allowed to use where, uh, to uh, address food in the foodborne outbreak without EFSA. And it's not often or not always that EFSA is willing or, or have the capacity to, to produce these joint assessments. Plus, EFSA requires a mandate from the Commission. So if the Commission feels, as a risk manager, that there is no need to do anything from uh, their side, then we are alone and we can't, we can't come out to the general public with the information we have, even though we know it's important. So it's very unfortunate. Another, the scientific community remains a little bit aside because we don't have, we have very, very little resources, handful of experts and handful full of work. So we have very little time actually to put on writing papers. We encourage instead the member states to take the lead and then produce these scientific papers. So it's, it's, it's a, really a struggle that uh, dealing with foodborne diseases and you cannot really address it without EFSA. That's why we try to also identify these uh, communication channels actually at the EU level without uh, informing the general public. But then at least making the risk managers fully aware what's going on because we have no mandate whatsoever on risk management, whereas member states have full rights, risk management and assessment, both.